So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show my work, talk about a, my work, but I'd like it to be fairly interactive. So if you guys have questions, comments, anything else in the middle, then just jump in, yeah? So what we're going to do is a uh, little introduction first. My name is Rohini, artist, amateur astronomer, eclipse chaser. I studied painting and printmaking, but I work in video, sound, objects, big drawings, all kinds of stuff, right? I'm going to show you a lot of work, not very much, some work through two frames, two frames of reference, wonder and the strange. These are two kinds of ways that I approach when I make my work. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they intersect, they often feed back into each other. So what I'm going to do now is, Harsh, can we put off the lights, please? Not all of them, just some of them, okay. So I'm going to show you first, before we jump into my work, I'm going to show you two images that will be a bouncing off point and I want us to keep these two images in mind when we move forward, yeah? Can anybody tell me what this image is? Yes. This is it? Is that okay? I can't, how do I turn it? Maybe, maybe, maybe we can increase the volume of the mic. having the control. Sorry guys, one sec. Yeah, what is this image? Yes, but it had a name. Does anybody remember what the name was? Who said that? Yeah, somebody said the, the blue marble actually. It was called the blue marble. Sorry, let me finish this up. One sec. Should I just use the mic? Yes, sir. Like this? Like this? Yes? I can't talk louder than this. This is okay? <laughs> or I'll use the mic. Is that okay? Yes? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Okay. So, yes, this is the blue marble, right? This image was taken by the crew of the spacecraft Apollo 17 on its way to the moon in 1972. And does anybody know why this image was so important? So I'll it's the first time the Earth was seen from space as a single sphere, right? So at the end of the 1960s, this image replaced another image in everybody's consciousness, the mushroom cloud, right? This became a symbol for a unified planet. Even if you look at the Anthropocene or you look at the climate change, you look at any of these arguments, this idea, the idea of a single planetary unit is at the center of it all. Now, this is another image. Can you tell me if there's any difference between the two? So this was another blue marble released by NASA in 90, uh, sorry, in 2012. This image, the one before, was taken from a distance of 29,000 kilometers, right? So Apollo 17 was moving away from the Earth towards the moon. It turned back, or rather the crew took a picture from 29,000 kilometers. This image was taken by a satellite that was orbiting the Earth at 930 kilometers. From 930 kilometers, you cannot take this picture, right? You have to go 11,000 kilometers away from the Earth to see the Earth as a sphere. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a tiled image, right? It's one image that is made up of lots of different images. And there's a super book, which I highly recommend you guys read, which is called How to See the World. And the author, Nicholas Murskov, puts it really well. He says, this blue marble is made to seem as if it was taken from one place in space, but it was not. It is accurate in each detail, but false in that it gives the illusion of having been taken from a specific place at one moment in time. Such tile rendering is a standard means of constructing digital imagery, but it is a good metaphor for how the world is visualized today. We assemble a world from pieces, assuming what we see is both coherent and equivalent to reality until we discover it is not. So basically, what does that mean? Very simply put, all of us build ideas of the world, right? We build ideas of the world from bits and pieces of everything that we look and see around us. My idea of the world will be different from your idea of the world will be different from your idea of the world. So just keep this in mind as we move forward. So a little bit more about my work then. I always have been and still am a huge fan of sci-fi, speculative fiction, and a lot of that kind of stuff, right? And I'll tell you why a little bit later. But the reason that I'm bringing this up now is that in 1997, which is the year I finished school, which is close to when, not well, when you guys might be finishing school, I was looking for a science fiction convention in Delhi, which is where I live. 
And I was like, where can I find a group of people who are as interested in sci-fi as I? I couldn't find them, but I found these guys. These are the Amateur Astronomers Association in New Delhi, also called the Bohemians. And every Sunday, they would meet on the roof of the Nehru Planetarium, and over chai and samosas, we would talk about the sky, right? We would talk about astronomy. Many of them were studying math. Many of them were studying physics like you. Many of them were not. Many of them were documentary filmmakers. Many were photographers. Many were just kids who were just interested in the night sky. And there are many other groups, some of whom may be doing programs in your schools. This is Space. This is another organization in Delhi that does outreach. But the point is, these are groups of people who are drawn to the night sky. So what happened is, you know, as happens in life, I met them, we hung out, we used to do star parties, uh, you know, meteorite showers, eclipse chases, all this kind of stuff. And then I lost touch with them until July 22nd, 2009, when India was witness to one of the longest total solar eclipses of the century. Does anybody, everybody knows what a total solar eclipse is? Yes? Okay, hands up. Who knows what a total solar eclipse is? Okay, so a total solar eclipse is when the moon comes in the path of the sun and it completely covers the surface of the sun, right? So when you're standing on the earth, you cannot see the sun. So for the moment of time when the sun is completely over the moon, uh, the sun is completely over the sun, this is called totality. That is a total solar eclipse. A partial eclipse is when the moon doesn't completely cover the sun. This eclipse in 2009 was special because it was six minutes of totality. That means six minutes of a time when the moon covers the sun. And usually, this period of time is one minute, two minutes. So six minutes is a very, very long eclipse, right? And I went to Patna in Bihar to try and see the eclipse with a group of amateur astronomers. So this is the roof of the planetarium. Everybody's waiting anxiously for the eclipse. It's supposed to happen at about 6 o'clock in the morning. But as you can see, this is about 5 AM, and there's lots of clouds. 6 o'clock comes. And the eclipse begins, and nobody can see anything because it's raining, right? So it's completely clouded out. I can't see anything. Nobody can see anything. It's cold. It's wet. The birds are going crazy. The usual thing that you hear about eclipses. But the atmosphere on that roof is electric, right? People are laughing. People are crying. Oh, dear. People are like, wow, what's going on? So it seems like, you know, lots and lots of excitement. Anyway, eclipse finishes. Nobody can take anything. No cameras, no, you know, no telescopes can be used. Nothing can happen. But that's the only image I was able to take, which was rubbish. But there was a feeling, you know, there was a sense that there was something in the air that could be maybe channeled, something that could be used. So I used this opportunity. I wrote a proposal. There was an organization called Sarai in Delhi, which I just basically said, I want to interview amateur astronomers. I want to try and understand why do they do what they do, right? Why do these people spend so long? They all have day jobs. Why do they spend so long chasing eclipses? Why do they spend all this time and energy doing these very difficult things as a way of understanding why I do it too? So over the next year, I interviewed lots and lots of amateur astronomers in Delhi and I traveled with them to different you know, observations. So this is to see uh, annular eclipses, various other events, right? And what happened is, out of this body of work has come a kind of history, a kind of chronicle of these people whose lives have been transformed by the night sky, OK? And out of that has also come visits to many, many amazing observatories, which are in this country. So we're going to come to the first frame. Remember, I told you there are two frames that I want us to think about. The first one is making a case for wonder. <laughs> So wonder is something that I am very personally invested in. Wonder is, I think, something that maybe is even going a little bit out of fashion because the word makes you, know, it th makes you, be makes you think about the, be the beautiful, maybe, or the sublime. But wonder actually has a very complicated history. Wonder is not as simple as we might think it is. And there's a wonderful um, historian, there's a wonderful uh, you know, author, a historian also, uh, Sara Ahmed. And she has a lovely quote, whoops, which I'm just going to you know, read out to you. Wonder energizes the hope of transformation and the will for politics. Wonder as an effective relation to the world is about seeing the world that one faces and is faced with as if for the first time. What is the status of this as if? To see the world as if for the first time is to notice that which is there, is made, has arrived, or is extraordinary. You know, wonder is about learning to see the world as something that does not have to be, as something that came to be, over time and with work, and as such, wonder involves learning. 
So very simply, wonder makes you think about the world as if for the first time, right? And that is very interesting. So we'll think about that for a little bit. So now to some of the work that I do. I told you already that a lot of interviews with these amateur astronomers involve traveling to a lot of these observatories. So this is one amazing observatory not far from Bangalore. It's the Gauri Bidnur Decameter Radio Telescope Array. And it's a fabulous, beautiful telescope array. What you're looking at here are radio telescopes. So these are not optical telescopes, right? These are collecting observations in the radio frequency. These are the older telescopes and these are newer radio heliographs that monitor and study the corona of the sun. So what is the work? This is another a picture of the same observatory. So this is the work, right? I'm just going to let the video play in the back. This is a seven minute film, which is called Atmospheres. Now, if we think back to the image of the blue marble, right? What is that blue marble? The image again makes us think about the distance between us and our imagination of the earth, right? But when I was at Gauri Bidnur and I was shooting the sky, so this is a fish eye lens. Does everybody know what a fish eye lens is? It's basically like a lens that mimics the fish, the eye of a fish, right? So it has a 360 degree view and you point it up at the sky, right? So what I have is I have these collections of recordings from different parts of the observatory. But what happens is you have these lovely telescopes which seem to trisect and bisect like a sphere, like a globe. So it seems to me at least to offer another perspective on the blue planet, but from our perspective on the ground, right? So suddenly the sky becomes a mirror and you have this you know, another way of saying that maybe we don't need to go that far to be able to think about our own planet as a single sphere. So I, it's a, it'll just keep going so we don't have to, I mean, you can look at this online if you want. You can go and check out my website. So another work, which again, in a similar theme, thinks about the idea of planetary units, thinks about the idea of ecosystems. I'm really interested in, uh, what are they called? Ter terrariums. Do you guys know what a terrarium is? Yeah, what's a terrarium? Perfect, exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. Like a miniature ecosystem, usually in glass, and it's usually um, sort of self-contained and all that. And I love this. I love those. I love the idea that they're kind of mini worlds. So the work, again, this is one of my favorite science fiction authors, Ursula K. Le Guin, and this is a quote that sort of goes with the work. So what is the piece? It's a 10-minute video, which is um, about an artificial little terrarium that I have built. And what happens is over a period of 10 minutes, this little ecosystem grows and grows and grows. It also starts to generate its own climate. So it starts to get clouded up. It starts to, you know, sort of build. I'm not sure how to strip forward in this, but we will try. Let me see if I can do that here. I don't know how to do that here. But anyway, you take my word for it. I can't do that here. But the work itself is not shown like this, right? So how we show it is like this. It is, sorry, just sort of a little bit of repetition over here. The work is projected onto a wooden pedestal. Wait, come. <laughs> yeah, any minute. Yeah, so this is the work, right? So you have a wooden pedestal. There is a dome top. The video is on top, it's projected down below onto this wooden pedestal. So what happens is when you walk up to it, it's about this high, it's about this wide. You feel like you're seeing a little glowing, growing terrarium, right? And it goes through these little cycles of day and night. So I don't know if you can notice here, there's an, like right now it's dark, this is night. You pay attention to the eclipse at the bottom when it goes to day, then you have a little eclipse at the bottom. So it goes through cycles of day and night, day and night, and it'll keep going through again, as I said, cycles of cloudiness. I'm not sure how to flip forward. Ah, yeah, so you get an idea of it, right? It's already getting cloudy. And by the middle of the fifth minute, it's fully occluded. So it's just like a little cloud on the top. And then it goes back to a forest again. And these are just images of what the work looks like when it's installed. And any, like I said, any questions at any point, just let me know. Pardon? Ooh. I think left hand of darkness, yeah. But yeah, that's not random at all. Very relevant since we're talking about her, yeah. 
So this is both atmospheres and terrosphere installed together. So another amazing site, speaking of sites, this is a, a fabulous observatory in Ladakh, the second highest observatory in the world. And this is run by the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Hanle. And this, of course, is one of those places that all the interviews I was doing with these amateur astronomers, they kept talking about Hanle. It's at 14,500 feet, right? So that means there's no dust, there's no air pollution. So it becomes a place that amateur astronomers really enjoy going to see. And as of last year, it is home to India's only dark sky sanctuary, which is very, very important and very, very significant, right? Because the idea that a dark sky is something that we should be protecting as much as anything. Because again, this idea that we might have generations of kids who grow up without the stars is deeply, deeply disturbing. OK, so what is the work? When I went to um, Hanle, I was really amazed by this incredible landscape. Sorry, this is just me doing a big drawing. I should have put these images later. This is the work. It is a very large site-specific wall drawing. This is 27 feet by 24 feet. And projected onto the wall drawing are seven videos that I recorded in Hanle, right? And I was interested in how these incredible telescopes become chimeras. Does everybody know what a chimera is? Chimeras are these, you know, like sort of Greek mythological creatures. They're hybrids. They have like, I think, the head of a eagle and the, I forget now. Lions, eagles, lots of things are involved, right? So I'm interested in how these telescopes become one thing standing in for something else, but they're looking at something else, right? So this is, this is the work. It's a seven channel film, which is projected onto a wall drawing. And then the drawing is done with charcoal, with pencil, with uh, acrylic, and also with this kind of reflective metallic paint. So that depending on where the video interacts with the drawing, you kind of get another layer of, you know, um, yeah, interaction. Now we're going to switch frames. We're going to talk about the strange, which is my other big thing that I'm really, really interested in. So we were talking about wonder. And if you remember, we talked about wonder asking us as if, right? So what happens with the speculative? What happens with science fiction? Really good sci-fi, really good speculative fiction asks one question. What if? Wonder says as if, this asks you what if, right? That's the basis of a lot of sci-fi, of a lot of really good speculative fiction. And the interesting thing is if you ask questions that begin with this, it can take you in very interesting, more nuanced directions when you think about anything, when you think about nature, culture, when you think about artificial intelligence, when you think about gender, when you think about many things. And within this, this is another, I don't know if you guys are old enough to read him, but maybe we can circle back and you can check with your folks. But this is an amazing uh, author. His name is Jeff Vandermeer, and he writes what is called eco-horror. But the reason that he's so interesting is he sort of puts you in a completely different position. He's like, not, he's like also almost the anti-Anthropocene. He says, what if there is no us and them? What if there is no difference between nature and culture? How uncomfortable will that become, right? So his thing is, what if nature is in a perpetual state of camouflage? What if everything is a transitional zone? Have you guys, no, you're not old enough to have seen it. Anyway, there is this book, the first one, which is called Annihilation, which you will forget as soon as I tell you this. But the reason that book is interesting is it talks about first contact, right? So that means the first time humans encounter aliens, but the contact is not with an alien, it's with a zone, which is called Area X. Okay, so anyway, the point is this is a zone which completely distorts everything within its path. So what is the work that I do? This is a series of three very large, I call them symbionts. They are sort of organics that I create that are made up of photographs, drawings, prints, and then they're printed out very large. They are glued onto the wall or on canvas or on paper. And then what I do is I draw on that again to sort of create a kind of contamination or proliferation that goes beyond the edges. So I'm interested here in this idea of a darker ecology, this idea of a nature that looks back at you, a not passive nature, a nature that is behind the eyes. Do you know what I mean? When you close your eyes, it still feels like you can see what's going on. And the idea also is that, you know, um, yeah, each of them, so this is just an installation view of the work. And as I said, this is the kind of, you know, so it's like color pencil, again, a vinyl, charcoal on the walls, little bits of proliferation everywhere. But each, this is the second in the series, each of these has a different genetic base. So like the first one was much more about 
uh, pitcher plants, uh, there were sharks, there was human. This one is much more wasp, locust, insect. And then this one is much more snake. And these are all uh, very, very large. So I can print them up to 15 feet and I've installed them. This, this wall, for instance, is like 60 feet long. So all three of these were next to each other at about 17 feet by 15 feet. Yeah, any questions at any point, just let me know. Um, yeah, the next body of work is very cool. I love this stuff. Um, also strange in an amazing way. Do all of you know what acoustic feedback is? You know, when you put a mic near a speaker, what happens? You get that sound, right? That reverberation? Yeah, exactly. So I work a lot with video feedback. Video feedback is the exact same thing, but with video. So what you can all do this at home. I highly recommend you try it. So it's like any TV, any handheld camera back then, because that's what we had. I don't know if you guys could do to try something else, but you plug the camera into the TV. So that means if I point the camera at you, your face will come on the TV, right? But if I point the camera at the TV, then it's looking at itself. Right? So it's like two mirrors. When you put two mirrors next to each other, what happens? Infinite number of reflections. So then what happens is, if you control the ambient light, if you control the settings of the TV, then you can generate forms that start to mimic biological light. They start to look like plant forms, tree forms, cells, snowflakes. And all of this, these are all still frames, right? So I'll give you an example of what I mean. So like this is an example of very basic video feedback. This is just my camera. I'm holding it. There is a TV, right? I am moving the camera. And so a circle becomes a square, becomes a pentagon, becomes all these other cool things. But I'm, it's such an amazing system. Because if you think about it, it's not fed from the outside in any way, right? The video is not picking up an image outside and putting it in. It's feeding. It's a loop between the two machines. And it's generating forms that are basically an example of the self-organization of pattern in nature. Harsh, I will need your help because I don't know how to make this guy play. Oh, like oh. So this, if you can it's tell. An octopus arm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you know my Ooh, voice is that me. That's my mom's hand holding a camera. Oh, you know? oh my god. Oh. It's, my it's my cat in the background, unnecessary. So now if you see, this is the mirror, this is a mirror, and by just moving the mirror and moving the camera, you, you're basically creating fractals. You're able to create an iterated function system just with mirrors and a camera and a TV, right? So what do I do with this stuff? I shoot layers, I shoot hours of video feedback, right? Then I dump it into my machine, I chop it up into pieces, and then this is a basic video editing software. This is Adobe Premiere Pro. And then I basically stack layers of moving video to build work, right? So it's a bit like a backward jigsaw puzzle. It's a bit like you figure it out. You, you have the pieces, and then you see what it's going to be. So just to give you an example of the kind of work that this produces, um, I'll play the video. This is called Arboreal. And I'm really interested in, you know, like L systems, which are a way of modeling plant behavior. Some of you may already know about them. But this is not um, an algorithm, right? What I've done is this is one piece of video feedback. So I've basically stacked manually because I like work that takes forever. So I just stack layers and layers of video feedback until I create a forest of video feedback trees. But the interesting thing is, if you remember, the one before this was blue. That's because it was an old school cathode ray TV, you know, those big ones. This is on an LED TV, so it seems more like bone, which is really interesting, right? So it looks like a cross section of bone. It looks like a tree. It looks like an x-ray. I'm trying to see if I can go forward for you guys. So it's 16 minutes long, which we don't have to look at. But how do we do this? Harsh, I need help. Where is Harsh? Is Harsh here? No. Can anybody else? Do we know how to go forward? <laughs> I j no, no, no. I want to go again. I don't know how to do that in this uh, particular version of. OK, anyway, it doesn't matter. Skip it. Take my word for it. It becomes a big, it becomes a big tree. OK? 
Um, there's a lots of other work I've done with it as well. So there was, um, I'm interested in evolution, I'm interested in cumulative evolution, I'm interested in how there are many theories about how we got to be as complicated as we did, right? And there's one lovely um, article I came across by somebody whose name, of course, I will forget. But he talked about the idea of a hopeful monster. So what does that mean? What he was saying is that we are used to thinking about evolution as being very slow, right? Cumulative evolution, slow, 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 and then big changes at the end. But he said ever, every once in a while, it is possible that you will have an evolutionary jump. And if the environmental conditions are stable, if everything is good, that one mutation might stabilize and become the next stage in evolution. And he called those hopeful monsters, which I loved as just something to think about, you know? So this work is called Hopeful Monsters, and it is a six channel film, I mean, video installation along with a print. And what it is, is that each cabinet houses different new species or alternative taxonomies of insects. And again, many of you may already know, if you look at butterflies, butterflies are a really amazing place to study morphology, right? Because you have 18,000 species or varieties of wing pattern just within one um, species or genera of uh, things. So, these are all made up of video feedback, and if you, would, if you look further at the work, so each cabinet is made up of different insects, and each insect shares some wing patterns across um, their sort of, you know, like you'll have wing patterns that are shared across the species. So when you have, there's also a very large print which is part of the work, so when you come up to, this is quite a big print, so when you come up to it, you're able to tell that, you know, the wing patterns are shared across, um, yeah, species. The last work, uh, which I'll show you in this series is just uh, recently commissioned by the Busan Biennale in 2001. Do you guys know what diatoms are? Do you guys know what radiolaria are? What are they? Very good. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, essentially, they're microorganisms, right? They are a kind of algae, but they are tiny algae. And the amazing things about um, diatoms and radial area are, are that, sorry, what? It's fine, I believe you. Um, but basically they are, they, are, they are a kind of algae. So this work is called Glasshouse Deep because it's a glasshouse of the very deep. It's about how strange the very deep can be, but it's also about thinking about how the very small can assume a kind of planetary scale, right? What is amazing, so this is an installation view of the work. I'm just going to let the video play a little bit in the background. Um, I won't play all of it, it's 10 minutes long. But I'm interested in these amazing um, forms because for several reasons. They again have the most incredible glass exoskeletons. They are bilaterally symmetrical. They have radial symmetry. Oh, I put off the volume, yeah. So here what I've done is, um, I worked with the Korean Institute of Marine Sciences and they gave me images that their scientists had collected of diatoms from the South Korean Sea. And then I worked with that and with video feedback to create a film which is about many things. It's about light, it's about, um, you know, sort of migrations of trajectories of, you know, telescoping upwards, downwards. It's, it's about many, many things, but it's also just about this idea of the very small the very large. I feel like you will all fall asleep if we watch this, so I probably will not play all of it, yeah? Um, yeah, so I can stop here and we can stop here or I can show you another work which is a brand new website-based project which is called the Observatory Second Sight, which is also about the distance between seeing and perceiving and how both are really strange and wondrous at the same time. So I'll, anyone, I mean, if you guys want to stop here and take questions, or if you want me to keep going, just let me know. Okay, cool. So we'll switch to...
So we can put maybe a, a couple more lights on, just a little bit. Can we put on some more lights at the back? Thank you. OK, so a little bit of background to this. This is a collaborative project that, that I did with a really amazing sound and performance artist called Legion 7, who is based in Berlin. And we have been working for about two years about a project that is thinking about the complex and complicated history of uh, observational astronomy, but also about observation in general, right? So what happened is that in 2019, I had curated an observation, right, an overnight observation. I took a group of um, people who had never looked through a telescope, as well as people who had looked through a telescope, and I took them to an observatory not far from Delhi, which was run by a very close friend who is also uh, an astrophotographer and an amateur astronomer, Ajay Talwar. And we curated an overnight observation. So from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., Ajay had planned an observation. So we, you know, we looked at planets, we looked at deep, deep sky uh, clusters, we looked at many, many things. But I was interested in what does it mean to look at, what does it mean to observe observation? What does it mean to think about the histories of observation? What does it mean to look at that in this context, right? So many, many things happened that night. But one of the things that was really interesting is, OK, how many of you guys have uh, looked through a telescope? Oh, wow. This is great. All right, all right. And what did you see? Venus. OK, the moon and Venus. Tell me honestly, how many of you guys were a little bit disappointed by what you saw through the telescope? All right. All right, yeah, exactly, right? It's a bit of an anticlimax. So why, why is that? And this is what I was interested in. This is what this work is about. So when I say the word Saturn, or when I say the word, let's say Saturn, you guys all have an image in your head? What is that image, just out of curiosity? Yeah. I'm betting that the image in your head has either been produced by Cassini, New Horizons, or maybe even James Webb. Fair? Yeah, OK. So what happens is the same thing. For me, for all of us, we have all these images of Jupiter, of Saturn, of anything, right? And then they take up life in your brain. So all these entities are ascribed a, a shape and then a meaning. You know, you build a thing around it. So what happened that night in the observation is we looked at Venus, we looked at Jupiter, and then we looked at Saturn. And Saturn. Somebody looked through who had never looked through a telescope before. And this is a 14-inch Dobsonian, which is a pretty solid telescope, right? But Saturn was this big. <laughs> so he's like, is that all? That, that's what it is, right? It's a bit of an anticlimax. So then, usually what will happen, I don't know if this happened with you guys when you did your observation, the astronomer or the amateur astronomer might take you aside and tell you, well, you know, actually, Saturn is 1.4 billion light years away, right? It takes 79 minutes from the for the light from Saturn to get to your eye, for it to hit the light receptive photons on your eye, and then you see Saturn. So what happens then is suddenly there's a bit of a shift. You know, it's like suddenly you're aware of your position vis-a-vis -vis Saturn. You're suddenly aware that this is a bodily experience, like you are looking through a telescope. But this is what we were interested in. This is what I was interested in. So that observation happened. People went home. And some of them sent me notes afterwards, you know, sharing their thoughts. And one of them, was a beautiful quote by an artist. Some of you may know, some of you may not know. But this is Jibesh Bakchi, who is part of a collective in Delhi. I don't know if you can read this, so I'm just going to read it out to you. That object, or what we thought it was, as known through models, photographs, etc., is not the object we saw. What happens is a kind of opening in your head. What you are seeing with this technology, this telescope, is what Galileo saw, what hundreds and thousands of amateur astronomers have seen, and is something that will appear for you if you untrain your mind of the way you have been trained to see it. It is a very circular way. So this is Jibesh talking about this event, right? I'm going to see this planet because I have been mobilized to see it, because I have seen amazing images of it, etc. But what we saw that quiet little object in the sky, the time horizon of it, to even think about 1 billion kilometers is a bit complicated. You have to rapidly unlearn what you have seen before to even make it intelligible. So what happens is a search for language, 
you have to unpack your seeing of the world, right? So this became something that was really interesting for me, for, for Legion 7. And then the work that actually came out of this was a performative essay where we worked with, I'm just going to show you the work, right? So this is, this is the body of that work, where we basically created, uh, I wrote an essay, Seven read the essay, Seven interpreted the essay, there was video, there was sound, there was all kinds of other things. But we were basically thinking about, this is, this is our way of navigating our content, right? So does everybody know what this is, by the way? Do you know what this is? This is an amazing little gadget that you can make or you can buy online, and it's called a planisphere. It's an old school analog way of navigating the sky. Every amateur astronomer used to have this. So basically, before you had Stellarium, before you had all these apps on your phones, you had an analog version of that, which is a planisphere. So what happens is you have this amazing two rotating disks. And depending on where you are on the Earth and the date and time, you can look at the sky above you. But of course, our planisphere is different, right? Our planisphere allows you to navigate our material. So we have the object, which is Saturn. We have the observer, et cetera. We'll go back to the object right now because Saturn is very interesting. Okay, so here we go. This is, this is the object. Wait, sorry, I have to go forward. So the reason that Saturn becomes so interesting for us is that the earliest observations of Saturn were in 1610 when Galileo saw it. We don't have to go into a lot of details. There's a whole lot of information in this, and you're welcome to check out the website later. But the reason why it's relevant maybe for us today is when Galileo saw Saturn, he saw it like this. We don't have to go into the details of the text because you can read that later. But basically, when he wrote a letter to the Grand Duke, he said that Saturn is one body that is three times larger than two smaller bodies on its side because his telescope couldn't resolve the rings, right? And it took 65 years, and people kept observing Saturn. We can see that this is a ring, right? You guys can tell that this is a ring, yes? But they couldn't. Why couldn't they tell that this was a ring? Was it just that the telescopes were not good enough? No, because apparently the telescopes were able to resolve it, but it required a certain shift, which didn't happen until Christian Huygens, when he actually said, this is a ring, that is the only way you can explain the fact that sometimes Saturn looks like this, sometimes it looks like this, depending on its position versus the, the Earth, right? But look at that. Just think about that, right? There is a distance between what you see and what you perceive and what you make sense of, which for me is very similar to your experiences also of looking at Venus or looking at the moon and being disappointed until maybe somebody tells you, but this is what you are seeing. Anyway, long story short, that is this work, but around this as well. So you're welcome to please come and navigate this, but if I'll just skip forward from here. In addition to that work, which was what Seven and I did, we invited three collaborators to contribute work as well. And then these are all people who have looked at the prompts, like Jibesh's prompt, like other people's prompts who attended the overnight observation, and then they have built their own work and contributed um, material to it. If only you had been born during the daytime. This looks familiar, no? Yeah, so I did the video for... Among the trees. Work. Yeah. But we can... Not the cat. You know, you can, you're welcome to navigate this later. It will just keep going. Um, it's a beautiful website. The observatory second dot site. Please check it out. And I think I'm going to stop now because I've been talking for almost an hour. And I think it's good for us to be able to chat a little bit. So this is the website, the observatory second dot site. And if you want to contact me, that is my details. And maybe we can just put on the lights and take questions, please. Yes. Mic, mic, oh, okay. I don't have a mic. Um, am I audible? Okay, yeah. Uh, greetings, ma'am. Uh, so I really like how your career has paced out. 
like you know i always thought that a way of exploring how you want your life and the legacy you leave behind to be would be through college like you take a college class you get a degree and you pursue it further through a career but like the way that you uh, you discovered your passion for astronomy through a group and you uh, made it into a whole career that's very inspiring but also um, i just want to know the impact that you make with your work like is it accepted because i feel uh, a lot of in a lot of places since you said you're an amateur astronomer does the, re the 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 research that you do or the work that you do how often is it accepted by you can say the, uh, more universities or other publications and what do you feel like what's the impact that you were thinking of when you started working like this and what do you think your uh, career could look like in the future wow I'm so sorry. You can answer any no, that you I want. Can answer all of them. But that was that's that's big, big question. So I think, see, the first one is that uh, I might redirect the question to say also because I'm an artist, the acceptance is in a different also arena, if you like. It's not so. But um, okay, I, I think maybe it's, no, it's a very good question. I will say this: I've been working for a long time. It looks really fast, right? But this is a long, long body of work. We're talking almost 20 years. Well, wow, yeah, 20. It's a long, it's a long body of work. So these things take time. And when you say acceptance, a lot of that comes with um, building conviction in your own instincts, which takes time because it means you have to trust your own um, gut. It means you have to trust your gut, right? And you have to keep believing that you're doing the right thing. And it doesn't always work. So even when you say acceptance, let's say that when you're a young college of, college student and then you're making art, it's difficult to know what is accepted. The only advice I would give is you can't, when you're making work, but this is specific to art, uh, What I don't know what it is that you might become or do, but it's slightly different in different fields. But in art, you can't, I can't think about what the, a reception will be while I'm making it. There is a moment for that, but it is not in the making of it because then it ends up becoming, it interferes with the process, right? If you start to think about how people will receive it before you begin, this is again different for different things. We're not talking documentary, we're not talking more, you know, it, there are different ways in which, and I forgot the other question, sorry. What was the other question? What? The path forward, right? That was the question? Yeah, like I feel um, I've never seen a career like yours before. So I'm just curious, like, where do you think this might end up to be? Because I mean, I've, I've, I've always heard of college as the next step after school, right? Yeah, I, and I did college too, yeah. yeah. I mean, you did, but then you ended up in astronomy and all this. Like, you didn't learn that in college, right? No, I didn't. Nope. So like, how, how did that end up for you? And how do you think uh, this might lead into your career? So, let's think of it this way. Like, think about authors, right? Think about your author. Like, think about any favorite non-fiction author, for instance, a fiction author, sorry. They are able to, let's say, today they want to write a novel or they decide they want to work on, let's say, free diving, right? So they might spend five years free diving and then they might decide they want. So it's not dissimilar. It's like, what are you interested in? How, it's not, it's like, what, how do you look at the world? How do you try and make sense of the world? And how are you going to find a way to express that? For you, it might be through science. It might be through research. For me, it is art. And yes, I found, actually, amateur astronomy was just something I did on a Sunday for five, for 10 years until that eclipse. And something happened on the roof of that planetarium, and that changed everything, right? But it was an instinct that said, okay, let's just write a one-page proposal and see what happens. And it got accepted. So these little moments of affirmation, these moments also where people uh, believe in your work, that also slowly builds. So it's a very, it's a gradual process, but you have to kind of stick to your, your guns. But it happens, it's slowly, slowly. Yeah, and be kind to yourself. Give yourself time. That's like, honestly, so inspiring. I feel that's the most inspiring GIS I've attended till now. Um, so oh could, you, God, so yeah. Thank you. could you share an email if possible? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you so much, okay. Absolutely, please, that's so sweet, thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Ma'am, this is Panya Chaudhary from Mumbai. Ma'am, earlier you had showed us a few slides in which you were showing us your uh, art, yeah. which you said that we could like feel once we close our eyes. Yeah. Feel behind, uh, behind our eyes. Ma'am, what was the reason behind you creating that art? 
I'm really interested in things that walk the line between beauty and horror. I like things that walk the line between the wondrous and the strange. I'm interested in the links between horror and wonder because actually they're much closer than we think. Horror, terror, wonder are very similar. There's a fabulous quote, which I thought was too much for you guys because it's very long. But there's a wonderful historian of science who talks about these three emotions as being um, very closely linked, you know, because they're the, what did she call them? Now I'm going to mangle this. See, this is, I'm going to get it all wrong. But basically she talks about how they force you into a state of being both skeptic and believer. You know, so like you're they're like, am I really seeing this? When you're in a moment of terror, you ask that question. When you're in a moment of wonder, you ask that question. I'm interested in that space. So that's why I am interested in those works. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am. Pardon? Yes. Oh, a long time ago. I don't remember. I think if you Google it, you could find it. Oh, no, there was an issue on botanical art a while ago. Yeah. Ma'am, your art was really beautiful. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, hi, good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Earth from New Delhi. Uh, ma'am, I wanted to ask, ma'am, when you researched on dye atoms, do you, uh, did you research about the fluorescence effect of dye atoms? Yes. Uh, ma'am, so why is it observed like uh, greatly in Puerto Rico rather than other places? Like, oh dear, not like that. I have no idea. But I can tell you that I was really interested in the fact that they use light in this way, the fact that they're called the jewels of the sea and, you know, of the opals of the deep, and the fact that for them, like, they use light to photosynthesize, but they also have a urea cycle, which is crazy, right? They are plants in that they photosynthesize, but they have a urea cycle like animals. How amazing is that? And, you know, so they're like these weirdly chimeric things. Apparently, they've inherited that from some kind of horizontal transfer from marine bacteria. So I could tell you that, but I do not know the answer to this. I apologize. But um, it is a very good question. Yeah, I can, I'm sure you can find out. But yeah, it's, I will find out for myself as well. Yeah. Hi, Rohini. Thank you. That was a lovely talk. As usually, I think we should have more of this. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I wanted to ask whether you ever thought about how wonder can often lead, lead to its own extinction. Mm. And uh, let me try to explain what I mean. Yeah. Um, so, those photos of Saturn you showed. Yeah. So, let's say if I was existing during that time yeah. and I was going through those photos, yeah. there are a million different possibilities that come into my head. Mm. But then you fast forward and now there's technological accuracy. Yep. And all of those different forms of imagination finally collapse into one which is an objective truth of how Saturn actually looks like right. as opposed to the million ways it could have looked like. Right. So I don't know like have you ever thought about how people who wonder often sort of you know uh, they start on this path where their own span or their own space for wonderment starts decreasing. That's a super question. <laughs> And actually, I would come back to exactly the same thing. So for me, the answer to that is not an answer, but at least for me, it is in the field. So it's going back into the field and looking at it from your own eye again. Because I do feel like all of these imaginations of these objects, again, as you said, also it's, in, it's a kind of imagination, right? Like James Webb or all of them have lots of, there's lots of mediation. I'm interested in that level of mediation as well. But I'm also, I do think for me, at least, the wonder comes back just by looking up, so which is like, you know, just keep looking up, but which is why also I get really disturbed by the fact that actually in Delhi, we used to be able to do observations from the Nehru planetarium, and now for low threshold skies, you have to go eight hours out of Delhi, right? And this is nothing, we're not even talking about the fact that you can't see any stars. No, but I, I totally, I get what you're saying. But this is why also I feel like wonder when it falls off the wall, not the wall, falls off this line into other things is also really an active space. So it's not quite wonder in its own, Space, if you like, but this kind of line, it walks with horror and the strange. Like I did a lot of very interesting interviews with storm chasers as a corollary, is that the word? Yeah. To the amateur astronomer experience, just to see, you know, because one is drawn by extreme weather, one is drawn by the night sky. So I was like, what is the, what are the links here, you know, in terms of how do we construct the environment? How is the environment in turn constructing us? 
And what's so interesting is, of course, there is a temporal shift, right? So one is astronomers have a much longer scale. I mean, uh, storm chasers are both dreading and used to a much quicker, like weather is extremely ephemeral. But the big difference was trauma. The big difference was horror, was terror. That almost without exception, every storm chaser had had a near-death experience with a storm, which resulted either in a desire for control and therefore prediction, or wanting to get as close as possible to this childhood thing. So there are really interesting spaces there where I think wonder somehow comes back, but a different way, you know? Yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Hi, I'm, Hi, I'm Anamika. I'm from Chandigarh. Lovely. I absolutely love your talk. I, you. I can't stop smiling. So Thank I don't God. really have a smart doubt. I just want to know if you think, uh, if wonder and strange work a path between what if and as if, like yeah. could they interchange? I think they do. I feel like for me, what I'm interested in is how when you take the as if from wonder, so look at the world as if for the first time, and you take the speculative and say what if, and then you put them together, and then you make things strange. So if you look at the word speculative, specular comes from speculative. Specular is a is a mirror, right? So if you think about a mirror, I love mirrors, right? The idea of a telescope, the microscope, but also when you invert something in a mirror, any horror picture you look at, right? Mirrors are terrifying. Why? Because sometimes just that reversal is enough to make something very familiar, very strange. So I'm interested in how stranging can be like a strategy. Stranging can be a way of navigating even, of observing, of collecting, of recording, and then, yeah, absolutely. So I think it totally can, yeah. Thank you. I love your talk once more. I love women in STEM. It's so <laughs> wonderful to hear. <laughs> Sorry. Bye. Super. Thank you. It's great. Hi, Rohini. Uh, that was an excellent talk. Uh, very, very fascinating. Um, uh, I was I was completely bowled over by the insects that you showed, <laughs> and uh, my question is. Um, as an artist over there, are you trying to, you know, when you showed uh, the video feedbacks of the insects uh, fluttering and doing all sorts of things, are you trying to be imaginative there or are you trying to mimic reality? Or, you know, if you're trying to mimic reality, at what, uh, at what scale are you trying to do that? Because, you know, some insects flutter at very, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. they, have a, they have really high wing beat frequencies. So, so what are you trying to do there? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a super question. I think so also what's interesting is with that piece, which we can go back to, the images exist as uh, there's a, I'll find the, there's a link. I think it's the University of Austin in Texas. They have like a uh, 50,000 bug pictures, which are in the public domain. Beautiful images, right? So the base of every insect is a real insect. But on top of that is then, built a kind of further, much complicated layer of video feedback. But then what I also do with that existing insect is sort of play with it a little bit, modify it. I would say that I'm interested in it being informed by the way that it exists in the real world, but I'm not trying to mimic or at all replicate how they exist in the real world. It's much more an exercise in thinking about alternative sort of more fictitious speculative taxonomies, but also thinking about how maybe wings in this case could be shared across, you know, sort of different, yeah. So it's a little bit of both. And also what happens is video feedback is a bit like printmaking. I don't know if you, you know, if you have any, so printmaking is a, a kind of fine art. It is fine art, but it, the difference is that you work on a plate and the plate is either metal or uh, stone or silk, right? But what happens is if you, there are two parts to it. So you have plate making and the actual printmaking. So once you make the plate, then you can make multiple copies of the, print, right? But what happens is that if you continue to use one plate to build many, many layers, the thing is that every plate will lead a certain kind of way. I don't know if I'm making any sense. In printmaking, the material leads the way a lot. So video feedback for me, at least, is very similar in the sense that very often the material will suggest the way forward. So even with the bugs, even with arboreal, even with other works that I've done, when I'm working with the video feedback, it will very often suggest where to go. If that makes any sense, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, fascinating talk. I am really, really glad you didn't tell me what the talk was about yesterday, and I actually <laughs> showed up. Uh, I, I would have anyway. So, um, I I have a question which is not very well formed, kind of just you know, thinking out loud. Yeah. So I was thinking about your 
this access of wonder and strange that you're talking about and how it can, you're trying to explore how it connects to curiosity and human sort of drive for understanding something. I wanted to sort of flip that axis and think about applying this to subvert different kinds of normativities in society. Have you thought of, you know, how your work actually is in some ways querying or, you know, sort of looking at yeah. things without actually following certain things? Absolutely, and yeah, what yeah. do you think, how can your work actually be applied into questioning or querying things? Does that make sense? I don't no, know. No, no, it totally does. I mean, I feel like um, hopefully it's doing that. Those are things, that's just also the way I think. I, I do think that I'm not interested in these very artificial sort of separations of anything, whether it's gender, whether it's nature, culture, whether it's technology or otherwise. In terms of how it can be used, I feel like I hope that happens just organically. Um, I don't know if that, I don't know exactly what the question is actually. Like, I, I was wondering if you have actually thought about applying this to question things or sort of question normativities around you. I don't know. If I, I, I really think it, it could be a really powerful way of doing things. I, I don't know if you've thought about it. I just wanted to know if that's something you have considered. Do you mean in terms of the, uh, the work as the work, right? Or the work Yeah, or actually showing a mirror to the world and yeah. questioning it whether in terms of whether what you think you think is the right way is actually the right way or is it the only way. Yeah. Right? I mean, so, yeah, I hope that, see, mm -hmm. again, I hope that when I show the work, because there's always a lot of text that goes with it, it is, but maybe it, you, I know what you're saying. It's not explicit. Perhaps that would be something to definitely. It's kind consider. of that happens organically, maybe, but I was, I was thinking that maybe you could do it more explicitly. No, I think that's something. That's something ask. that I think would, would be really interesting. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the only thing I would be worried about there is taking space where maybe I don't, you know what I mean? That's the only concern I would have. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I had a very similar question, probably which linked with Siddharth and what Rohit was asking um, about. Uh, so you you do these processes, right? And you said you follow the material and how uh, when you're following patterns or whatever you're uh, following, that you follow a certain thing as the material leads you. But sometimes these processes can be the answers to a lot of questions which are unanswered in science. So when you collaborate with ICTS or NCBS, for example, there is a cellular context, let's say, of how uh, you know, vesicle pinching happens inside a cell, something like that, uh, a, a biological process, okay? So, uh, uh, but sometimes it's very difficult when you look at the process inside the cell to give some sort of an equation to it and use physics and the concepts of elasticity or anything to answer that. But sometimes when it comes from an artist's pers perspective, you can sort of predict things because the material is leading you. So do you, do you think you can, you are thinking of working with scientists on uh, figuring out uh, this in a collaborative way where you can, you can sort of overlay your predictions to some biological process having similar uh, outcomes? Do you think you, you've thought that way or no? Not so far. Because so far, I do not know if I'm approaching it with the rigor that might be necessary for that. So it would have to come from the other side first. You know what I mean? I think the other side doesn't know that you exist. So that is the, <laughs> the thing. No, because for instance, at ICTS, it was a very, uh, it was a very different conversation. They were talking about uh, abstract themes, which are very similar to actually what we're thinking about. So whether we're talking about gravitational waves, which are the new frontier of observational astronomy, these are things one can also dance around without necessarily saying, I'm going to do this. You know what I mean? But yeah, this, I think it sounds amazing, but I don't know what that would look like. So yeah. <laughs> you should talk to Mukund. <laughs> Hi. Hello, Hello ma'am. Uh, my name is Antra Masurkar and I'm from Mumbai. Um, my question is very vague. I just wanted to ask you to like elaborate more on the video feedback part. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like you'll use it for art, but what is the actual, like, what can you study with the video feedbacks? I don't know, you should totally find out. No, I do know that, see, it's been around for a long time. It's been around since the 1960s and many people have done many different things with it. The only articles I have found talk about it as kind of, again, a way to create IFS or iterated function systems. But I don't know what you could discover, but I would love to know if you are able to find out things because I think it's very cool. I do know that 
Um, it's not fluid dynamics. I know that there's nothing to do with that. That's I've been established when I went to ICPS, but I don't know actually what you can study. But I think you should. Uh, yeah. And let me know once you do. Yeah. Um, yeah, so adding on to what uh, Ambika ma'am said that uh, you thought, wait, what did she say? <laughs> I forgot, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I heard Andhra talking, I just forgot what she said. I think uh, something about you not making hypothesis or something, something around that, right? Yeah, basically working with um, scientists. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, but then, then again, early scientists, they were basically philosophers. Like they went from asking what is life, then what is one plus one, and then what is that we see in the sky? So why don't you think that you would be able to make some crazy predictions like that? No, I'm, I'm open okay. to it. It's not like I'm not. But at the moment, there's right. other things happening. But it sounds exciting. Yeah, why not? Okay, and I mean, uh, if we look at it uh, logically, I I know that b before technology was this huge thing, people, uh, uh, scientists actually used to make sketches about what they could see from their measurements, about what uh, yep. so something could look like. So um, I, I'm not sure how deeply involved in the mathematics aspect of it, but do you th think that's another possibility that you could explore? Maybe, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, I'm uh, Ishika, I'm here, the three of us are teaching ecology um, and so there was a lot of relevance of course in what you spoke about today and it was really nice to have that really fresh perspective and I think what we've also been trying to do is bring the as if and what if from the slightly scientific side of things into the classes. So it's really nice to see how you hit kind of reach those same milestones of thinking through a different perspective. Um, so now that you've also spent a lot of time learning about astronomy and also looking at the biological world and evolution, I was just thinking about your uh, subjects going forward as well or maybe even what you've done so far because what we've also been exploring is how to just ask the same kind of questions in many different systems so at this point at you know where would you look beyond earth and where would you look within earth yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so actually that's a great question um, at the moment there are two parallel bodies of work happening one is almost done it's based out of this uh, amazing observatory in the south of india kodai canal solar observatory which you may or may not have been to it's amazing it's one of the only a few places which has more than 110 years of continuous data of the sun. So every year since 1904, they have been taking images of the sun. And the observations range from hand-drawn sunspots on small disks of paper to glass photographic plates to you know H-alpha calcium K images. And I went there during an eclipse and I was able to record my own data as well. So I've, the work is a four-channel film which looks at the ways in which we might complicate People's readings of, so basically backstory, it was during a residency at the Open Data Institute in London, right? So the Open Data Institute runs a data as culture program where they ask artists to come and complicate ideas around data. So I did lots of, like six months of interviews with the staff there, this was all online. And I was, you know, trying to understand exactly the same kinds of questions I would ask an amateur astronomer. What is data? What do you mean when you hear the word data, right? What does data mean to you? And one of the things that came up is this idea of a digital twin. Right? So a digital twin, I'm sure you all know, I mean, I didn't know at all, but it's, you know, the idea that you have a physical system which replicates, um, sorry, you have a digital system that replicates something in the physical world. But now there's talk of a digital twin of the earth, right? So the idea that you can somehow program a kind of digital twin of the earth without bias, which will then, and without, with, with, which will sometimes have, have, somehow have all the subjectivity and complication, it's kind of, mind blowing for many reasons, you know, so I was like, what I was interested in with this work is pushing against this idea of data as being neutral, data as being objective, data as disinterested, and rather the fact that actually, at least with Kodai Canal, data is collective, data is collaborative, data is material, whether it's paper, whether it's glass, and data is human. So the work, that work is basically four channels, which is looking at different ways in which we have recorded our nearest star. The other work, which is where that first image is from, I did uh, 26 days on, a, on an oil tanker three years ago. So I went from Fiji to Samoa uh, and then to Singapore on this oil tanker. And then you're, 
You're traveling through skies which have no light pollution, where the Milky Way is overhead every year, but you're also carrying 50,000 tons of diesel and <laughs> petrol. So it's like, it's a very strange sort of, you know, idea of what it means to be, a, to be, what is the field, what is the observer, and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, these are two current things, but uh, right now, what uh, Ambika mentioned, which is this ICTS grant, I'm going to CERN at the end of June, so now, the idea of the, of the observer when it's quantum mechanics shifts completely, you know, who is the observer, what does observation even mean, does observation become an interaction now, or is it still a measurement, is it both, is the question irrelevant, yeah, I've forgotten what your question was, but, yes, yeah, <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you very much, that's very kind. Firstly, um, in which other STEM fields do you think art can be incorporated? So this is an interesting question. I'm going to redirect that a little bit. Because I feel like actually art and science are walking the same path. I just feel like they're different frames. You know what I mean? Like they're just different ways. So I would say that actually as much as anything else. Yeah. Because it's just different ways of, in fact, sometimes even the same way of looking. It's just the tools and the language might differ but they're actually very similar. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it's a good question. My second question is, what advice do you have for aspiring artists? Oh, aspiring artists? Are, are you an aspiring artist? Okay, so two things. Be patient. It's a long road in the best possible way. I don't mean like it's gonna take forever, but I mean like it's a long road and be kind to yourself because you know, just be gentle. And also just learn to trust your own instincts. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. Ma'am, why did you choose to depict vegetation in a form of strange and wonder, not something else? Vegetation? Yeah. Like the, which one? Like the thing? Like was... snake, for example. Oh, why not vegetation, you mean? Or... No. no. I mean, why did you choose to depict only nature? Ah, as opposed to? In a form of strange and wonder. But as opposed to what? What is the, what, if not nature, then what? Anything else? Such as? Uh, anything else? No, no, but I'm interested. No, it's a good question. But such as what? What is the anything else? Hmm. Abstract art. Okay. So I think the reason is that it's actually much more uncomfortable when it's this familiar. Right? So for instance, when a tree is not a tree, but it could be something else, it's more unfamiliar, it's a little bit more, but where is, you know what I mean? With things where you are not, which are- Familiar to us. Yeah, also things that maybe we take for granted, which then suddenly have another sort of life, you know, that maybe we're overlooking, which is why a lot of, there was a page of Jeff Vandermeer's book that I had up, which was very interesting because it talks about uh, moss that grows words. So then the question that the biologist asks is, how is it growing words? Like, what does that mean? What does it mean for moss to grow words? You know what I mean? It becomes a very different question when it's something like nature or vegetation, because we assume that plants are somehow, yeah, you know, act passive. Yeah. So good afternoon. My name is Divya Solanke. I'm from Mumbai. My question for you is, what is your favorite artwork you have done till now? Mine? Yeah. Oh, wow. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I love all of them when I'm making them. Uh, sometimes. The one I'm working on right now, the... No, the one I'm working on right now, I'm very, I love a lot. Because it's a very long work. It's encompassed 10 years of work. So it feels like it's really important. I hope it. Uh, I was just telling um, your teacher, it's about solar. It's about, it's about an observatory in South India. And it's about 100 years of observations of the sun. 
So it's about the people at Kodai Canal, it's about the observations, but it's also about our relationship to the sun. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So <clears throat> like to one small technical question. So you talked about the video feedback part. I was really interested. So you saw, you showed um, making tree-like structures, the white um, tree-like structures using layering different uh, video feedbacks or videos. So, and you said you modulate some kind of a, like, like, is it like an immersion thing or do you control what it produces, oh. the video feedback? What I meant is that when you're setting up the video feedback setup, you have to have not too much light in the room okay. and not no light. So you have to have a source of light, like either a lamp or something, so that there's controlled light. Then you have to play with the adjustment, like the contrast and the color of both the TV and the camera. Then you get an optimal, you have to play with it a bit. It's a very chaotic, dynamic system. It's very difficult to recreate the same behavior twice. Yeah. That's what I meant. But when it comes to actually making the work, it's much more uh, intuitive. So you kind of, you know, just start to build. Like I said, it's literally like a backward jigsaw where you're taking pieces and then you don't know what the image is, what the final work is. Yeah. Right. So like if you had to make, as you said, if you had to make the same work again, then like, is it like an immersion thing then? Can we so, emergent oh. thing means? Oh, as in emergent in the context of like. Oh, emergent. Yeah, yeah. I think the behavior is emergent, but right. not the work. I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, another thing I had was um, similar to that, but like, who's your favorite artist of all time? Oh God. There are too many. There's too many. It's you can difficult. give a few names. It's fine. Favorite artist. Uh, no, I'm totally drawing a blank. Um, I can suggest if you have, I, have you, have you uh, looked at the works of MC Escher? Yes, of course. So like your work and whatever little I, like I sat and attended your talk and whatever, all that reminded me of was MC Escher's work. Thank you very much. No, and, I love his work as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, if you, I mean, I think you have had, but you've read Douglas Hofstadter's uh, yes. I Am A Strange Loop and uh, GEB as well. And like, I've, I've gotten halfway through GEB and then I started reading I Am A Strange Loop, it's quite dense. But like all of your talk reminded me of that. So that was great actually. <laughs> yeah, and uh, one last thing before I give the mic to someone else. Um, one possible, so people are asking like you what further like you can do and like what kinds of fields you can explore through your art. So I was really thinking of, I've been seeing this, seeing this artist impressions of turbulence um, mapping and like fluid dynamics. And like I am, like I'm a physics student here, so we think we try and think of like like mapping fluid dynamics and turbulence is still the most like unsolved question in physics right now. Yes. And maybe uh, there's a lot of potential for like great artwork and like turbulence studies. Because in fact, when I went to ICTS, I spent a long time talking to the team at Flu the the faculty from fluid dynamics. I also did a soap gravity experiment. Oh yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Really hard. <laughs> Happily do more fluid dynamics. It was really good. No, you're right. It's one of the big unsolved things, and it's it's crazy that we can model a gravitational wave but not a cloud. Isn't that crazy? Mm. I think that's amazing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. A who? No, John. Who? Oh. Joseph. I do not because I do not approve of NFTs. Because I think they're completely self-defeating. I feel like they are completely illogical. They're counterintuitive to the logic of what it means to be a meme. Create this kind of artificial scarcity. And uh, yeah, I'm not a fan. So no. Uh, hi. hi. Have you ever had like a creative block, like an art block? Absolutely. Yeah. So like, how did you get over it? Or what What did you do to get over it? Great question. The, the key I have found is not to work to a deadline. I used to, when I was younger, it was always deadline based. So if there's an exhibition, then I would work only, you know, up to that. But I've realized that's not how I, my work doesn't work like that. So I work every day. Every day you do a little bit of work so that it there's no 
pressure like that. And uh, also, I do think that happens, you have to not keep hitting it. You know, matlab, if you are feeling that there's a block, you have to leave it alone. You have to do something else. So I often do many, two things at the same time, maybe three things at the same time. Sometimes one thing will feed back into the other, but sometimes it just is not the right time. Like very often there's calm that happens five years later. You know, like that first image I showed you is footage that I collected in 2018. Because I don't know how, I don't know what it needs to be yet. So sometimes you have to just leave it alone. But also work, every, I work every day. Little because then I don't feel that I can't work with pressure anymore. You know, you need to manage time. So that's what I do. Have you had a writer's block? Three years. Yeah. Well, maybe you need to write something else. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it just needs to come. You need to come to it with something different. You know, maybe that thing needs to just be put away, and you need to come to something else. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you, thank you.